More AD on the radio. Back once again, the ill behavior. Delivering and giving you my musical savior. Back once again, it's your boy AD. And again, nobody rock a body better than me. Back once again. So if you're just joining us, got an email a little while ago. Just a couple days ago. From the mother of a listener, who's a listener herself of one of the radio stations that I work for, Rockin' a 5-3 in San Diego. And she wrote, on May 15th, at about 9 p.m., my son Aaron Foley was helping his buddy who lost control of his motorcycle and fell off. When he went to go across the street, he was hit by a truck, which resulted in him being paralyzed from the waist down, broken ribs, as well as road rash, cuts, bruises, both lungs burst, and a lacerated liver. Aaron is now at the rehabilitation center, working hard to continue to live his life to the fullest without being able to walk. My son has asked that Corey Taylor of Slipknot and Stone Sour come to visit him when he's in town on the 20th. As a mom, I've tried very hard to make this happen, but I'm only finding dead ends. Please let me know if anyone might be able to assist with my request. Well, immediately reached out to Corey Taylor's record label, management, anyone we could think of to try and make this happen. But we knew going in, look, there's every reason a rock star would not be able to make something like this happen. Every reason. Look, it's it's their time. It's short. It's limited. Folks like this that get to that stage in the game like Corey Taylor has work really, really hard a lot of the time. Every second of every day is accounted for and filled with some sort of responsibility. I remember once, I remember once one of the guys from the Goo Goo Dolls told me, like, you think being a rock star is just slacking off and having a good time? I get up earlier than my dad does every single day, and my father's a mailman. <laughs> so, like I said, super last minute reaching out to Corey Taylor, every reason why he wouldn't have been able to do this, or maybe wouldn't have wanted to do it. This might have been the one little bit of free time he got in the day. We didn't know, but we had to try. Here's the thing immediately came back yep where do i have to be what do you need me to do let's go see this guy yeah for sure not even a question absolutely so i go pick up Corey taylor at the venue and drive him out to the rehabilitation center to meet aaron and there's a video of their meeting which i'm going to post it's great great stuff just because it was the best thing i've ever gotten to do in radio Seeing that level of compassion from one human being to another didn't matter that that person had records that we play on the air. It was, like I said, that level of compassion that made it special. And it's that stuff, that stuff, my friend, that will get us through. But on the way out to the hospital to meet Aaron, I had a really cool conversation in my car with Corey Taylor. And, uh, well, let's take a listen to that. So we're off to uh, we're off to meet Aaron, who's a huge fan of yours. Yeah, yeah, facing a huge challenge, he when trying to help his friend who had been in a motorcycle accident, he was hit by a car. He lost, he's basically lost the use of his legs, and he he's a humongous Slipknot fan, a humongous fan of everything that you do. Yeah. and you've taken time out of your day before the show tonight to go see him, say hello. He doesn't know you're coming, by the way. Yeah, so crazy. his mom set it up, and we're really excited for it. Was there ever anything like this? Like one thing that has been the case since day one with Slipknot, with Stone Sour, with everything that you do, yeah. is you are completely invested in your fans. You are close with them. You have a real relationship. Anytime I've been to see you, it's not not like a band playing it's a shared experience between yeah. you and the crowd yeah did anybody ever do anything like this for you was there like someone that did something similar say, or that you not you were really. so invested in their music no no i mean i was i was just invested in the music you know like it I, it wasn't honestly until i got on the other side and, and started working in this business that i really started loving the fact that a lot of the people that I listened to were also good people, right? right? Like good humans, good, you know, people who just went out of their way for, for the fans and, and just went above and beyond. And I kind of took my cue from that, you know, like it was, it was one of those things where, you know, I, I kind of went off the rails a little bit when I was younger, obviously. Um, 
music kept me on the straight and narrow, but it wasn't until I saw that human side that it gave me something to aspire to as a, as a person myself, because inherently I just, I wanted to be a good person, but I was trying to find that balance uh-huh. inside this industry. And sometimes you're encouraged not to be. And it gave me the confidence to be like, you know what? I'm going to do my own thing. Even if it comes off as, uh, you know, goody goody or, <laughs> you know, not as edgy or whatever. It's like, I, I, I kind of had to just say that uh-huh. and be like, I would rather be myself than play a part for 20 years. I certainly am not pretending to be somebody else in my, my right. music. Why would I pretend to be somebody else in my life? Right. You know? So that, that was something that I took from the people who I looked up to. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but but it, like I said, it wasn't until after I got on the other side and I really saw the other side and honestly experienced the work that goes into this, which there is quite a bit if, yeah. you're, if you're dedicated to it. So, so I guess I'm I'm kind of lucky, and you know, maybe it was because I could feel that in the music that I could see that there was a definite um, good individual trying to purvey that that message. Uh-huh. Do you remember you said that you noticed some of the the guys and girls and bands you liked were really solid people. Yeah. Do you remember the, who that might have been? Like, oh, Rollins, definitely. Yeah, um, Henry Rollins. Like, just if there was ever a dude who I, you know, looked up to the most, you know, between him and Mike Patton, uh-huh. like those would be the dudes um, that, like, once I really started to develop my talent as well you uh-huh. know, like, and my writing skills, like those were the dudes. Um, that I really looked up to. Before that, people like, you know, everybody from, you know, James Hetfield to Sebastian Bach, because I was a huge Skid Row fan as uh-huh. well. Nikki Six from Motley Crue, you know, like, like, so, like, people who were really invested in kind of getting their, you know, getting together and yeah. being good people, you know. Um, and also, you know, encouraging the audience to have a good time, you know, like, that, because that's, because there's that give and push and pull that goes on there. So. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, once I kind of developed my you know my style and, and saw where my strengths were, you know, that was where you know that's when I really you know started to realize that I was closer to Rollins and, and Pat than than anybody else. Not right. taking away from my enjoyment of the other music, sure. But I just knew that was was more where I was at. You know, did you uh, do you think maybe something like listening to Get in the Van or reading Get in the Van sort of affected the way you approach life on the road? Actually, Big Ugly Mouth was closer to the point. Right. Um, Because I I mean, I'd I'd had uh, all of Henry's like spoken word stuff like Uh, even way before Get in the Van got. Right, right. Yeah. He he used to come to Iowa twice a year and Uh, we would always go see him do his spoken word stuff. So we would see stuff that he was working out before he even recorded it. Right. It was really cool. That's awesome. I told him that, you know, late years later when uh, you know I, I got to meet him and everything, uh-huh. and he just started laughing. He's like he just and he would just go off on these crazy tangents about all these places that he would go, <laughs> and, and you could just sit there and listen to him for hours. I remember you know? the first time I ever came across a spoken word was the Box Life, which yeah, is like this yeah. massive box set, yeah. which, <laughs> and like I, it's so weird because I've spoken to so many people, myself included, where yeah. that's essentially been a roadmap for life. Like yeah. so much of you know like what Rollins has done. In his in his spoken word yeah. has been sort of like kind of a guide to the world for a lot of people. Yeah, man, and it's which is good because it offers more to life than the the surface stuff that music can offer. Yeah, you know, with a lot of music, it's either hey let's party or hey everything sucks. You know, and <laughs> yeah. there's really no in between. There's no practicality to uh, it. You know, and for me. I've tried to kind of fill in the blanks on that as, as much as I could, but with Rollins, man, it was just, it was purely instinct for him. It right. just made sense, which in a lot of ways you think would make sense for a lot of people. You know, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, duh, let's, let's kind of show that other thing. So for him to share that, man, is huge. Yeah, I think, I think one thing, like a lot of people, and I, I kind of see this in what you've done, Rollins just seems to have said yes to pretty much anything that comes his way. Like, huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. And he, he goes, 
off and does it and it <laughs> makes total sense looking at what you've done where it's just like you want to go play acoustic for people at a pub in England sure yeah. you want to go tell stories to people and not play any music at all <laughs> why not and yeah. it like but it all works and it's like it's almost like you live your life out loud and it becomes content for everything that you do whether it's a yeah. stone sour record a slipknot record spoken word acoustic and any of the above I mean I can't I can't speak for Henry, but, you know, when you work so hard, you eventually kind of get to the point where you can you can then follow your interests. Uh-huh. Like, I don't just take opportunities because they're they're offered to me. Trust me, I turn down way more than people even know. Right, right. Um, but the stuff that I do do is absolutely my wheelhouse, my interests, and stuff that, even if I've never done it before, like acting or stuff like that, or even the books, uh, it was just stuff that I always wanted to do, I had interest to do, you yeah. know, like, so, I've, you know, it literally gets to the point where after a certain point in your life, if you've worked hard enough and you've, you've garnered that kind of success, thankfully, uh, you can start to trade that hard work for, you know, interests paying off, you know? Right. Yeah, no, I mean, you get to... It, when I look at you, I look at a guy that is doing all these things that he would be doing whether or not they were his job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's stuff that I would be doing behind closed doors, like whether anybody was paying attention to it. It's like music, though. I mean, if I wasn't doing... If I wasn't doing this, I'd still be making music. Even yeah. if I was just jamming on the weekends with friends or just doing weird SoundCloud recordings uh-huh. now, you know? Leave the stimulation to the professionals. Everyone is so smart. KBRC, more stimulating talk radio. There's something happening here, and you should know what it is. <laughs> the dumbing up of America. Now, more AD on the radio. So here's more of my conversation with Corey Taylor in my car on the way to go meet a fan, Aaron, at the hospital where he is in rehab after having been paralyzed from the waist down after being hit by a truck. Do you remember the moment where it kind of became clear that music was it for you? Because do did, did you read uh, that book Dave Grohl's mom wrote about raising a rock star? Uh-huh. No. She wrote it like right in time for Mother's Day. And she talked to other moms of rock stars. Yeah. And it seemed as though right around a early teens, you know, like 12, 13, 14, they'd already had an aptitude and a love for music. But she was like, yeah, I saw at age 13 this was going to be it and I better figure out how to give him the best shot at doing this. Do you remember a moment where there kind of wasn't any turning back? No, not really. I mean, I, I, I think it was a series of moments for me just because my, my home life was a lot more sporadic than most, right. you know? Um, and my grandma is actually the one that really encouraged me to, right. you know, encourage, like helped me get equipment and, you know, encouraged me to practice and, and like jam with other people, you know, loved my songwriting to this day. She still loves it. You know, like I, I went in and, uh, she was in the hospital and I played her one of the new songs from the album, St. Marie. And it's really inspired by growing up, hanging out with my grandmother and my uncles and aunts and stuff, and listening to the country music that they right. listened to, you yeah. know, and she just started tearing up, like she loved it, you know, like really? it, was, it was really cool, you know, and that, being able to share that moment with my grandmother is huge, um, because she inspired, like she encouraged me not only to, to, to pursue it, but also to work as voraciously as I do, she is insane. Like, she still works. Uh-huh. She's 90 years old. And she's at, she actually had to take some, some time off because of health reasons. And, she, right. and she's pissed about it. Like, she's not <laughs> happy. She retired from one place, uh-huh. took a year off, got bored, went back to work. She's been working at this place longer than the place she retired from. And I'm like, you're a maniac. Right. Could you just let yourself be 90 for, like, two seconds? And she's just <laughs> mad all the day. I'm like, come on, man. So that's kind of where I get it, you know? Right. Like my grandmother is just such an inspiration that, you know, she's like, she's like, you know, do what you want to do. And if you do, you'll never, you'll never be bummed out. You what, is your, what does your grandmother do? It's like, my grandmother's an accountant. <laughs> she is sharp, man. Like, she is incredibly sharp. So when, she's very there as well. When you first started to, like, 
make a profession out of music? Would you would you dump off a box of receipts to your grandma and like make this no, into something? No. Do my taxes? No, I would never do that to her. Like she probably just <laughs> she probably would have done it too, but I didn't want to do that. You know, the first thing I did was uh, I had um, every plaque that I got. I made sure she had a copy. Oh, that's awesome! And uh, to the point where she had to told me to she told me to stop because there were too many of them. She's like, I don't have any room in my house for any of these. They're just sitting in corners, and I'm like. Yeah, but they're for you. And she's like, and I love you, but I have no room for these. Stop it. Like, I'm very proud of you. Now stop it. It was very funny. That's awesome. So, growing up listening to your grandma's country music brings me to the next question. Any uh, any truth to the rumors that I've heard about a Corey Taylor country record? I, it's something I've talked I've talked about, you know. Like, But my interest, dude, like, I fly all over the place. Like, I want to do a country album. I want to do a, a dark acoustic album. Actually, not too long ago, I started thinking, like, seriously thinking about doing a jazz album. Something really cool, like putting together my own group uh-huh. and rehearsing it and, and recording it live. Uh-huh. I've got about six or seven tunes that I've written what? that would actually lend itself to it. What kind of jazz? Like, what if, like if you slower, had to pick your like, jazz guy? Like, smoky nightclub jazz, uh-huh. you know? Like, where, like, it's, it's um, comparable to, like, if, uh, oh, God, how would I... If Billie Holiday sang with Coltrane and Miles Davis, wow, you know, that kind of vibe. Who's the like a little more, a little, a little, a little. Well, I, I guess with a little more swing to it. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. So who would be the uh, who would be the Coltrane or Davis in your group? Do you have it? Do I don't know. Do no, you have folks I, picked out. I mean, I have. I know a lot of people who play. Yeah, you know, but I, I, but I, I. I like, like I said, I mean, this is so new that sure. like, I haven't really even talked to anybody about it, but I do know piano players. Uh, who, so are we getting the first in the back of my car that Corey Taylor's making a jazz record? No, I've uh, talked about it, no. but you're like the third interview, so nice. this is the third one. <laughs> very yeah. good, very good. But yeah, man, like it's something that, you know, I, I definitely want to do. Like I just want to, I want to go in and over a series of like, you know, a couple weeks here and there and just really work it out and really do it and do it, and do it cool and, and really have fun with it, you know. So did you, uh, how did you get exposed to jazz music? Was it something that your parents were playing or I was no. your grandma was playing? No, no. I, I got into jazz late, to be honest. Oh. I, I got, actually, got, I only got into it because of the Ken Burns documentaries. Oh, right on. And I devoured them. Like, because oh. I'm a huge music history guy anyway. Yeah. And... Picking that up and watching it, I like something in my head just opened to it. Mm-hmm. Like I never thought I ever would, you know. Right. And I just went, "Dude, this is amazing!" And like I saw so many parables between the, the popularity of jazz and the popularity of rock and roll and whatnot, and how it all kind of, you know, one kind of tapered off, but one kept going, and yet one is still alive. And then there's almost a parable with that and hip hop now with rock and roll, sure. And yet one's still alive, and it's. It's it's insane. It's yeah. really really. It's interesting. You yeah. know How 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 that that history that 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 dichotomy kind of works. You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah yeah it's uh, it's really cool. So jazz, possibly country, Slipknot, Stone Sour, spoken word, acoustic shows. <laughs> Are you ever home? I am just to kind of pick up my stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I, uh, I have kitchens I visit, you know. <laughs> and you live in Vegas? I live in Vegas and uh, Iowa. I split time between the two. Yeah. How, do you, how do you decide where to go, when to go where? Um, I mean, it all depends on the uh, schedule. Um, it depends on, you know, like if I have my son who's uh, 14. Uh-huh. Um, he still lives in Iowa. Um, other than that, you know, if he's at school and I, I, I have short breaks... I'll spend a lot of time in Vegas. I just kind of hop back and forth between the two. Does your uh, son have? Uh, do you think he's a musician? Do you think he's already started his first band, man, which is kind of crazy. Um, he uh, he didn't like the he didn't like the name of it. Like he he was hitting me up. He's like, I need a new name. The, the original <laughs> name was Devils by Heart, and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And he's yeah. like, yeah, it's too emo. It's like I'm not into it. It's like I got to think of something new. And I was like, okay. Him and his friend just started auditioning people to jam with. So, and, what, yeah. what's your son play? He's a singer. He's a of singer. Course. Oh, oh, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and I, I got I to gotta sit him down and start teaching him guitar because this now, finally, he's interested in Right, it. yeah. Um, wasn't before. Like, right. all those years, I kept trying to sit him down and get him to, 
know, just learn a little stuff. He just didn't want to have it. But now he does. I'm now like, see? See? <laughs> if you'd have started when you were five, when I was trying to teach you, you'd be shredded by now. You'd be a virtuoso exactly. at this stage of the game. All well, I tell you what, time. <laughs> everything, everything with him comes naturally. Like, right. He sings naturally. He can dance his little ass off, man. It's, it's, it's insane how good he is. <laughs> and I'm like, if you didn't get that from me, I'd dance like I'm being shot at. So it's, <laughs> it doesn't really, you know... So it's it's cool, you know. It's 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 cool. He's developing his own thing. Right. He loves what I do. Right. He's proud of it. Um, but he also you can you can see that he wants to do his own thing, which which makes me proud as a father. Yeah. You know, like he naturally came to it. I didn't force it on him at all. Right. He naturally just started picking it up. You right. Know? And uh, yeah, so so like did, at, you know, he came to you with a question about the name. Does he come to you with songs like hey? Right now, he's not really working on writing anything. He's okay. just kind of they're just kind of like doing covers. They're into it. They're right. doing covers, and, and that's honestly, I'm encouraging that right. because that's the best way to, to figure out which what if you do write songs. Uh-huh. What do you want to write like? Right. What type of songs do you want to write? What you know, it's the best school that you could ever learn is sure. just playing covers and developing your own style. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's how I started. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like. It was, you're almost spoiled for choice. Like, do you think had Slipknot not jumped off the way it had, it could have very easily been knowing what you're capable of and knowing how much variety you've got to your voice. Yeah. It could have been a completely different type of music that, like, you could have gotten famous doing jazz records. Or, yeah. No, or, or I mean, acoustic singer songwriter stuff. Yeah. I mean, because I was doing that stuff even while I was doing Stone Sour originally. I was doing yeah. acoustic sets, mm-hmm. you know, all over the place. And, uh, yeah, I, I could have been that. You know, yeah. I, I think I never want to come off like I'm tooting my own horn, at, ever. You know, because it took a lot of people, a lot of work, and a, and a team effort, really, to kind of get to where I'm at. You yeah, know? sure. I've had a lot of people help. I'm very lucky. But I think for me, it was a matter of time. Right. Like, you know, there was no way I was going to give up and, and just settle for whatever I, I think I was always meant to be doing this whether right. it was with Slipknot or just doing it on my own acoustically you know right. so yeah I, I feel like in a lot of ways I'm really really happy for the way it, it came together to yeah. be honest because it just it feels it just feels special man you know well it is you have like you know, you're clearly someone without an off switch and <laughs> yeah. fortunately you have an outlet for whatever it is if you want to write something there's there's a chance to go do that if yeah, you want to yeah. write music if you want to write different types of music you have an avenue for all these things that would probably keep you up at night and probably still do sometimes <laughs> yeah. keep you up at night well since I don't drink anymore yeah it's right. definitely you know it's definitely restless sleep night do you uh, do you think that um, do you think that sort of like work has replaced drinking in some ways I, oh absolutely yeah I mean it's it's definitely replaced a lot I mean I'm I'm, I'm an incredibly addictive personality so no matter what my interests are I tend to go completely into it you know mm-hmm. like uh, and I mean, for better or for worse but at the same time it's like my my focus is such that I I tend to just do it until I feel like I'm overdoing it. Sure. And I try to, yeah, to taper it off as much as I can. Does uh, does your son play any, any covers of your music? No, but he definitely jumps around the house to it. Like he, <laughs> um, I'm just waiting to see where he's going to go with everything, you know, because he's he's into such like he loves heavy music and whatnot loves mine loves everything but he's he's also the he's the guy that turned me on to baby metal he's a huge baby metal fan oh really and I got to introduce him to them um a couple years ago and he his pants like he was freaking (laughs) out and they remembered it so much that on this tour they brought me gifts for my son which was really really cool that's awesome yeah I was really taken aback by the kindness of that it's like I yeah it was uh, it was really cool and I told my son that they brought him something he freaked out and he was like oh my god really that's I was amazing. like yeah yeah so yeah um it's cool so I, I I'm I'm waiting to see uh if he ever if he ever does something like that but um you know, yeah, we'll Sting, see. We'll Sting see Sun happens. Sting Sun was in a police cover band. Oh, really? And didn't tell the rest of the guys in the band that he was Sting Sun. Really? They're like, yeah, this guy even looks apart. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So maybe he'll pull That's that number. Funny. So we are just pulling into the hospital, getting ready to go visit Aaron. So we'll, we'll stop this for now. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, dude. All good, man. No worries. 
So at this point, we go into the rehab center, we meet Aaron, and it's an incredible and beautiful experience. There's a video up on my blog that you can check out. But now, let's fast forward to where Corey and I get back in the car after having met Aaron. So we're here again in the back of my car with Corey Taylor. We just met Aaron in uh, we just met Aaron in his rehab center next yeah. to the hospital. Yeah, amazing experience. Thank you so much for doing what you oh, did for dude. him. I wouldn't have missed that for the world. And, and honestly, he did just as much for me, man. Like, you want to talk about dealing with something incredibly painful and life altering, mm-hmm. and yet that young man has the best outlook I've ever seen of anyone in that position. He he lifted me up just as much as as I did anything for him. So yeah. He, he, was, was, he was a jokey guy. Yeah. He man. said the jokes got him through and I was like, you're in your weird chair now wheelchair now. You're probably you're stabilized. You've probably been on some painkillers. But apparently he started with the jokes in the with the jokes with the paramedics. Yeah. In yeah. the in the, in the, on the, way, to on the, the way to the hospital. After the accident. Yeah, I was like Yeah. I mean that is just a rarity these days. You just don't see that kind of fortitude, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, I respect the hell out of that. Like, that's, it's done a lot for me, man. Like, I'm gonna, this is heavy, you know? Yeah. And just the fact that that did something for him, just seeing me is, I take that shit very, very seriously. So, um, well, cool, man. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. It's all good. If you take a step towards me, you will take my breath away. So I'll keep you close and keep my secrets safe. No one else has ever loved me. No one else has ever tried. I never understood how much I could take. Show you where 